Would you stand with us and let's worship together this morning? scenes kind of people, not in front of everybody kind of people. So bear with us. Jesus is the joy of our salvation, and at Advent, we light candles to remind ourselves of the light of hope, the promise of peace, and the joy of salvation he brought to a lost and broken world. 
What is joy? Joy is a feeling of great happiness. It's pure bliss. It's overwhelming gladness bubbling up in your soul. These candles represent hope, peace, and joy. When Jesus came, he brought joy to our hearts. Isaiah 9, 3 and 4 reads, You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. Luke 2, 8 to 14 says, And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Let's pray. O oh Lord, our God, thank you for sending Jesus to bring us salvation and restore our joy. We rejoice because he came to live with us and in us and through us. May the good news of great joy of Jesus coming ever be on our lips. Help us to be yours as we wait for you to come again. We love you. Amen. Would you stand with us as we continue to worship this morning?
sing this next song as a worship team this morning we were talking this is a bit of a newer song still for the for all of us but um, if we look to the words of the chorus they're just so powerful so I'm just going to read them out and just hopefully we can focus our minds and our hearts on this it says there will be a day when all will bow before him there will be a day when death will be no more standing face to face with he who died and rose again holy holy is the Lord and I just I just would ask you this morning with us to just uh, focus your hearts and minds on that because there's nothing more powerful I don't think than that so let's worship together
this time the children are dismissed for Sunday school. You may be seated. It's a blessing to be together this morning. A nice snowy pre-Christmas morning kind of gets me in the vibe. That's the, that's the way they said in the vibe. I mean, I'm in the vibe for sure. Uh, it's a blessing to be together to worship at this holy time of year. And uh, just a couple of announcements, things that we want to remind you of. Uh, next Sunday is our uh, Emmanuel Christmas Cafe. This is where all the goodies come out, you know, and the hot chocolate and the coffee, and we linger and, uh, you know, put on some extra pounds to get ready for the Christmas season. So <laughs> keep that in mind. I'm sure there'll be like calorie-free cookies. There's got to be. There always is, you know. Um, also want to remind you, um, this Christmas, um, we're looking to put our Christmas love offering towards getting to the halfway point uh, in paying off uh, our carpet debt. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, let's lean into that together as a congregation and uh, reach toward that goal. I think we're right in close to around the 300 squares paid for, and we're hoping to get to 450 uh, by the end of the Christmas season. Uh, and you can just designate that either online or in an envelope and just mark it off as uh, the carpet, uh, for the carpet. And also the EBC Missions Committee is asking for your help for the next four weeks. Uh, different types of donations are being collected here at the church. And so uh, the donations next week, I don't know if they're up on the slide or not, but um, you can just go to our website and you'll be able to find out what uh, the donations are uh, for next week. Let's take a moment now just to bow our hearts in a word of prayer and ask God to prepare us to hear his word this morning. Father in heaven, Father, we thank you for the beauty of this fresh snow that reminds us, Father, that though our sins are like scarlet, you will wash them away and make them whiter than snow. Thank you, Father, that the beginning of the work of our redemption, we celebrate this season, Father, with the coming, the advent of your Son, Jesus Christ, to be a sacrifice for our sin. Thank you, Lord, that your Son, Jesus, took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. He humbled himself. Father, and condescended down to our level in order to make it possible for us to be sons and daughters of God. Father, such a privilege is beyond our understanding. The depth of our sin made it beyond what we ever deserved. But Father, thank you that your love for us was an expression of your grace and kindness to us through Jesus Christ. And so, oh God, at this holy season, we pray that as we hear your word preached and as we sing these songs, our hearts would be filled anew and afresh with gratitude. Gratitude for your mercy and grace, saving us when we didn't deserve to be saved, saving us when we were enemies in our minds by our wicked works and our rebellion towards you, saving us while we were strangers and aliens from your covenant of promise. Oh God, thank you for adopting us into your family by Jesus Christ, justifying us, sanctifying us, giving us new life, freedom from the oppression and tyranny of sin, and enabling us, God, by your grace, to live holy lives before you. Father in heaven, we uh, are reminded of those who suffer and struggle amongst us, Lord. We pray for those who struggle with mental health. And Father, we ask that you would hold them up during this Christmas season. Hold up the grieving and the confused and the fearful. Lord, we all identify with them. And so, Father, in your mercy, hold them up and help us to be a blessing and encouragement to them at this time of year. 
Father, we think of Bob Yellis' mom, who is still recovering from a stroke, and we pray, Father, that you would uh, continue to strengthen her and lift her up at this time. Father, we pray for many who are sick right now and pray that you would minister healing and strength to them and lift them up in your time. Father, we remember our church plants at Station 4 and at Cornerstone. Thank you, God, that your word is being proclaimed in these two locations even now, Lord, where once there was one church, now there's three, proclaiming your gospel in Hensel and in Lucan and in here. Father, we pray that that gospel ring out, would ring out with clarity and power, that many would be drawn to you and confess you as their Savior and their Lord. Father, that the Christmas message would go forth this time and in this season in a powerful way and draw people into these churches, Lord, by your Holy Spirit. Prepare their hearts to hear your word. Father, and bring them to faith in Christ, we pray. And now, Lord, we pray for us gathered here this morning. As we prepare to hear your word preached, Lord, soften our hearts, humble us, give us responsive hearts to your Holy Spirit. Lord, that our hearts would be set aflame with a new and fresh gratitude and wonder for the coming of Jesus. May our imaginations be captivated by the glory and the amazement of those first believers who heard this message. And Lord, may it cause us to respond to you in worship, in obedience. And so now, Father, we commit these things to you. Give us ears to hear what your Holy Spirit is speaking to each and every heart this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother Mitch, come up this morning and share with us what God has laid on your heart. This morning we're going to continue in the book of Luke. We're going to look at Luke chapter 1, so I'd encourage you to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 1. We're getting into the second song now. We saw Mary's song last week, and this morning we're going to consider Zachariah's song. One of the young men told me this morning that I should sing it for you, so I'm going to do that now. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to do that. Dutch men don't sing, and no, I'm just kidding. We do sing in church, I hope. I love to sing in church, but not at the front with the mic on. Um, But we're going to read it, so you can open up your Bibles. Luke 1, starting at verse 57, all the way to verse 80. Luke 1, 57 to 80. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her. And they rejoiced with her. And on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child. And they would have called him Zechariah after his father. But his mother answered, no, he shall be called John. And they said to her, none of your relatives is called by this name. And they made signs to his father inquiring what what he wanted him to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, His name is John. And they all wondered. And immediately his mouth was open and his tongue loosened and he spoke, Blessing God. And fear came on all their neighbors. And all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. And his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear and holiness and righteousness before him all our days. 
and you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these verses, these words given for our knowledge and even more for our transformation and salvation and sanctification, that you would change us, you would save us in forgiving our sins and having mercy toward us. And so, Father, we ask that you would reveal these things not only to our minds but to our hearts and impress them upon us this morning through your word and through your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we celebrate this week of Advent, we've turned to the week of joy. But that might not be the the feeling we all feel this morning. Maybe this week wasn't marked by joy for us. I wonder if our lives are characterized by joy in Christ or there's something else filling our minds and hearts. Ten months before these verses, we find Baron Elizabeth and her husband Zachariah. Luke began in chapter 1, verse 6, that they were both righteous. They were before God, walking blamelessly in all of his commandments. But Elizabeth was barren, and on top of that, she was old. We all know it gets a lot harder to have kids when you're old. I'm not speaking from experience, obviously, um, but we know that to be true. So they, this was unlikely. They had no reason to expect that God would answer their prayer and turn around or change their circumstances. And perhaps that's where you find yourself this morning. The trials of life have bogged you down. Your life circumstances are not what you thought they would be right now. Perhaps the holidays bring about challenges in your families or your friends or different relationships. Perhaps the sting of death or sin or conflict is far more common than joy. Perhaps some of us are struggling with our mental health or our physical health. Perhaps our struggle with sin hasn't gone well this week. And we're discouraged and we're unnecessarily staying under the guilt that Christ has already taken on. Perhaps our failures as parents or our insecurities as parents are causing us to wonder what we've done wrong or where we've gone wrong. Perhaps we're at a loss for how to help those who are close to us and are experiencing suffering. This morning, Luke provides a solution for our discouragement to our questioning. He points us to the tender, faithful mercy of God in the birth narrative of John. So I've titled this message, The Mercy of God in the Birth of the Prophet. We'll walk through the verses together and we'll see two important aspects of God's mercy. First, that his mercy is personal. That's in verses 57 to 66. And then second, that his mercy is promised. That's in verses 67 to 80. You'll see these two movements in the section that we're going through. First, the birth narrative of John, and then the second is the song of response from Zechariah. Each section ends with a focus on the child, a meditation on the child. The first asking the question, who is this child? What will he be? And the second, answering that question, telling us of what the role of the child is in verse 76. But throughout these two movements, the theme of God's mercy is brought up again and again. So my hope this morning is that we would all walk away with a renewed confidence in God's mercy. And we would have joy in the work that he has done, the work that he is doing, and the work that he has promised he will do. As I went outside early this morning, I couldn't help but feel the peace of a fresh snow. There was a thin layer. There was heavy uh, snow. What do you call it? Flakes. Snowflakes. There we go. Snowflakes falling down. And it was quiet. It was still. All the chaos of life 
the busyness, the trials, the suffering, you couldn't hear it. It was silent and it was still. As we see the nature of God's mercy and we take our eyes off of temporary circumstances to focus on his eternal work, my hope is that our hearts would experience that peace and that calm and quiet and we could rest in God's faithful mercy. So the first thing we see about God's mercy is that it is personal. God's mercy is personal and we should trust that it is purposeful. That's verses 57 to 66. So this passage actually begins a little mercilessly. Uh, the time comes for Elizabeth to give birth, and to no surprise, she gives birth to a son. I feel bad for Elizabeth. She only got, you know, five or six words there about her birth experience, but I'm sure um, she understands the primacy about who John is and not her experience. But the neighbors and relatives, they gather around and they rejoice with Elizabeth. God had heard their prayer and answered their heart's longing and given them a baby boy. So Elizabeth and John and their community are rejoicing together. But notice what Luke highlights is what God was doing in verse 58. Luke says they heard that God had shown her great mercy. It's God's mercy that their desires would be fulfilled. A personal mercy that God has shown to Zechariah and Elizabeth. As part of God's plan of mercy to the whole world, he was showing mercy to an individual couple. It was typical of the time to name the child um, when they were born, but Luke notes here that the baby isn't named until the eighth day on the day of circumcision. This becomes a, a common practice in the Jewish world later on, but here, this is the first time it was recorded in, in both Jesus' and John's birth. And I think Luke is trying to show us and emphasize that there's a link between the work God was doing at a different time in history. When Abraham was circumcised, he's, he was given his new name, Abraham. And so Luke is drawing the connection of the significance of God's work and tying it to history. And he will do that later on in Zechariah's song as well. So the friends and families, they gather around and they want to name him Zechariah after his father. It's a good name. But they're interfering with what God was doing. I'm sure many of us have had family members or close friends interfere with something that we're trying to do or a decision we're making in your own marriage or family. And I'm sure they're well-intentioned and good-meaning, but you can imagine Elizabeth not being impressed with them and saying, that's my kid, I birthed him, not you. And God told us his name already, his name is going to be John. And this comes as a shock to them. They say, no one in your family is named John, so why would you pick this name? And they turn to Zacharias to see what he thinks of this crazy idea that his wife had. And their, Zachariah's announcement on the tablet is that his name is John. At this point, Zechariah and Elizabeth affirm their faith in God's word and what he had told them in chapter 1. And they obey the command of the angel from God to name the baby John. And D.A. Carson reminds us that the name John actually means the Lord is merciful. The Lord is merciful. So another reminder of God's mercy. So the baby now is a personal mercy to Elizabeth and Zechariah, and he's a greater sign of the mercy of God in bringing about the redemption of his people through his sovereign plan. So all the relatives and the neighbors, they wonder at his name. But then all of a sudden, before they're able to discuss it or talk about it, John's mouth is immediately opened, and he speaks. And fear comes on all the neighbors, and everyone shares this new and exciting information around town. This isn't all that different from Exeter. We learned fairly quickly that when something big happens in Exeter, it's similarly talked about through the hill country of South Huron. So humans always love to share exciting events and experiences, and so they spread the news of his birth and the excitement around the hill country of Judea. And then in verse 66, Luke returns to the common language he's used throughout already this early part of Luke in his gospel as the people lay these things up in their hearts, and they wonder, what then will this child be? And Luke tells us the reason for their wonder. They were wondering because God was with the child. It's been hundreds of years since God was with one of his people in a unique and personal way, working among Israel. 
And so they realize the significance of this new thing that, that God is doing. And they have hope and joy in God's mercy to Elizabeth and Zechariah. And this is where we find the, the words of our theme for Ad, Advent. What child is this? Obviously, our text says, what then will this child be? It's not quite as pithy as what's on the wall behind us. So what child is this? And the, the question here is about a new work that God is doing through his spirit amidst his people. But if the people wonder at the birth of John, how much more should we ask that same question in reference to God himself being born as an infant? God becoming man to save us from our sins as the greatest display of his mercy. The sovereign king breaking into our lives to take us from death to eternal joy and life. God's mercy is expressed in these unique acts in history. But it is also a work in the day-to-day -day lives of his people. So as we reflect on God's mercy, let's remember that his mercy, his mercy is personal and tender. God is not far off. He's not removed from their situation or their marriage. He's not distant from his people. He cares for each one of them and each one of us now. And in fact, he knows us in a detailed and intimate way. There's no running from his knowledge or presence. We must accept the fact that he is acutely aware of us, of our sin, of our suffering, of our needs. And his heart isn't hard toward us. He doesn't behold our sin and wish he didn't create us like in the days of Noah. Rather, he's, he's, he sees our rebellion, our sin, and he longs to forgive us to bring us in, to reconcile us, just like Jesus expressed when he saw Jerusalem. Friends, God is not absent from your life, from your trials. He's not aware, he's not unaware of your longings that remain unmet. He knows our deepest cares and our deepest concerns. We don't often know why some prayers remain unanswered, but we do know what God's primary purpose is. God's primary goal is that you would know Christ and forsake all other loves in your pursuit of Christ, that we would know Christ and we would love him above all things. He wants this for us because that's the pursuit where, that we will find life in, eternal life. We won't find life in a spouse, in the perfect family, in a better job in even healed relationships, not in the relieving of our trials and sufferings of this world. So this morning, as we look for joy, rejoice in the mercy of God that just like Elizabeth's barrenness was purposeful, so your suffering is accomplishing an eternally significant purpose. Romans 8, 28 reminds us, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Friends, God is mercifully working for your good in all things. In these verses, we also saw Zechariah and Elizabeth resist the influence of the customs of their time in the naming of John. Luke presents them as an example, defying the cultural norms in order to be faithful and obey God's word. Likewise, Luke will call us to count the cost and to walk faithfully, to follow God in his calling amidst opposition and suffering that will oppose us. So Elizabeth and Zechariah believe God, and they act in faith. Faith that God is doing something significant. God shows personal mercy to them while he is at work doing something marvelous for all people. One scholar writes, Those the, Though these events are cosmic in their reach, they involve the divinity's personal touch. God has shown his mercy and magnified it to Elizabeth. Those who had shared her pain now rejoice with her. God's mercy expresses itself in concrete, loving action. Our lives, despite how they feel, similarly have God's personal, divine touch all over them. God may not answer our prayers in resolving the longings that we feel, but those unmet longings are not meaningless. They're not devoid of God's mercy. We can have joy this Advent season because God's mercy is personal, so let's trust that it is purposeful. 
In the second movement of this psalm, Zechariah turns to that cosmic plan of God. And we see that God's mercy is promised. And so we should remember his plan. That's in verses 67 to 80. In verse 67, Luke mentions that Zechariah is now filled with the Holy Spirit. In chapter 1, verse 15, the angel said that John would be filled with the Holy Spirit from birth. And then in verse 35, it's the Holy Spirit who comes upon Mary. But then in verse 41, Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit. So now Zechariah gets his turn. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. I don't think Luke is just trying to say, look at how spirit-filled this family is. Rather, he's trying to emphasize the significance of something new that God is doing. In Luke's second book, the book of Acts, he begins with the outpouring of the Spirit on the disciples, and he links the movement of the Spirit with the Old Testament prophecy in Joel chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. It says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days... I will pour out my spirit. Luke's showing the certainty of the new covenant breaking into the world through the Holy Spirit's work in their lives. He continues to show this through Zechariah's prophecy. This prophecy or song is called the Benedictus. It's Zechariah's song similar to Mary's like we mentioned, but it's in response to the birth of John, whereas Mary's was in response to the announcement of of the birth. I don't think John's song would have been very good if he tried to sing after the announcement, right? He couldn't speak um, because he didn't believe God. The name Benedictus comes from the Latin translation of those first words, blessing be. Um, And so it's a praise. It's a, a song of praise and blessing to God. But unlike Mary's song, which emphasized the great things God had done for an unworthy, a humble people, this song emphasizes the mercy of God in fulfilling his promises, and remembering his covenant. Zechariah begins by praising God for visiting his people and redeeming them. He speaks in the past tense, which is, which is significant. It's a present activity. It's something that God is going to do, and yet he is so sure that it will be done that he says God has redeemed his people. He is confident that this is as good as complete because the Spirit of God is here. He points us to the house of David in verse 69 and says, God has raised up a horn of salvation for us. This word picture of horn of salvation is a little bit of an odd one. My first thought was the the horn of Gondor from Lord of the Rings, you know, a horn that you blow into. Or some of you might think Susan's horn in the Chronicles of Narnia, where if she blows into it, there will always be help coming by, um, which would be great. But that's not what Zechariah is singing about, nor what Luke is writing about. Um, I don't think they were aware of those films at that time. Um, It's a little more Old Testament and a little less adventure fantasy. So let's look at what the Old Testament says about it. Psalm 18 verse 2 says, Yahweh is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. And 2 Samuel 22 Verse 3 similarly says, My God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my Savior, you save me from violence. The idea of the horn of my salvation is surrounded with words describing strength. They would have used it to refer to the idea of a horn of a bull. It's a weapon of strength and victory for defeating and fighting one's enemies. In our house, the most common horns are that of triceratops and unicorns. We seem to not be able to get away from unicorns and dinosaurs at the age of our kids. But as Zechariah is prophesying, Luke is showing that this work that God is doing is a fulfillment of God's promises to David, the horn of salvation from the house of David. The eternal king who is to sit on David's throne is coming. And he is going to be the strong one to rule and redeem God's people. Then in verse 70, he reminds us this is a fulfillment of what the prophets had spoken hundreds of years earlier. Verse 71 and 74, he emphasizes the victory over God's enemies. They will prevail. In verse 72, he returns to the theme of mercy. But now he refers to it as the promised mercy of the old covenant. 
The second half of verse 72 is kind of the center of the song. And it's the primary emphasis that Luke has for us, that here now in the birth of John, God is remembering his holy covenant. God's promised mercy is finally here, and he is going to fulfill what he said to Abraham, what he said to David, what he has said to all of the prophets of old. Do you see all of that fulfillment in the song? Luke is emphasizing how this new work that God is doing isn't just another step in the process of the redemptive plan of God. This is the step. God is finally and forever redeeming his people through the promised Messiah and his forebearer, the second Elijah, John. You can imagine the confidence and joy that Zechariah would have knowing God's promises and his personal mercy. Imagine watching a scary movie that just came out. I'm not very big into them. I had one experience with scary movies where my high school friends thought we would go see this movie in the theaters and about five minutes in I was sitting in the lobby with one of them just hanging out because I was not into that. I wasn't into that vibe, as Tim would say. Um, so, so you see a scary movie. The first time you see it, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know when you're going to be scared. You don't know, you know what the characters are going to do. And you don't know what's coming. And so you're on the edge of your seat. And they might actually get you. You might jump. You might scream. Who knows? Maybe you'll even cry. That's probably what I would have done. Uh, but the second time you go and you see the same scary movie, you're ready. You know what they're doing. You know their plan. You know how they're going to try and scare you, try and trick you, and it's not going to work. This is what it's like to live in light of God's promised mercy. Zachariah and Elizabeth had known God's promises and plan. They knew what he was going to do. So when God began this work, they had confidence and hope that no matter how things seemed, God was going to accomplish his purposes. Does this mean that their life went on picture perfect and they never had another trial or struggle? Well, certainly not even in John's life. We know that he had a significant and meaningful ministry, but then eventually he's imprisoned and then beheaded because of his righteous prophecies. Simply because God has a promised plan doesn't mean that it will be easy or pleasant in our day-to-day -day lives. God may call us to embrace extremely difficult suffering or situations, and yet his promises and his plan remain steadfast. As we face opposition in the world, we must remember God's merciful plan to redeem his people is as sure as done. Friends, our eternal redemption is secure just as the past has already happened. God will redeem us and nothing can keep us from that. But how are we to trust God's promise amidst such disconcerting circumstances? Well, the only way to stand firm is to know and believe the promises that God has indeed made to us. This is why we ought to be people of the word, filling our hearts and minds with the unchanging eternal truths of God, not the constant flow of information around us. We must know the purposes and plan of God as he has revealed it in his word. And we, we should make it our aim to prioritize keeping up with God and his word instead of our social media feeds or the news channels. This doesn't mean we should be ignorant or careless, but it should bring us to a point of peace where we can know the joy of this Advent season because we're not troubled by temporary circumstances. We're excited about the eternal work of God in Jesus Christ. Zechariah reminds us of the purposes of God's redemption in verses 74 and 75. He says that the deliverance is so that we may serve God without fear and holiness and righteousness. As this new kingdom is ushered in and Jesus comes to defeat our enemies and deliver us from sin, we are free to serve and enjoy him forever. So what's keeping us from rejoicing in Christ this morning? Let's turn to the promised mercy of God. Remember his plan to save all who would come to him in faith. This life is but a breath. Our eternal hope stands secure on the finished work of Christ. Matt Boswell and Matt Papa capture this idea in a new hymn entitled Almost Home. 
They sing, don't drop a single anchor, we're almost home. Through every toil and, train and danger, we're almost home. How many pilgrim saints have gone before us? No stopping now, we're almost home. That promised land is calling, we're almost home. And not a tear shall fall then, we're almost home. Make ready now your souls for that kingdom come. No turning back, we're almost home. They wrote this song based on Hebrews 11, verse 16, which says, As it is, they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Friends, we await a new city, a new heaven and a new earth, one that is sure to come and where there will be eternal joy and comfort forever. God has promised a kingdom free from the sting of death, free from the pains of suffering, free from the consequences of sin, free from all death and hardship, and that home is an eternal one. Remember where we are in God's plan. If you're in Christ, your suffering is not eternal, but God's mercy is. So find hope in the future redemption that is almost here. In the first half of the song, we see God's promised mercy. But now in verse 76, Zechariah turns to the child. Verse 76 turns to the attention from praising God to answering that question of the crowds in the beginning. What child is this? Zechariah says he will be called prophet of the Most High because he will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. It's worth noting the difference in what we're told about Jesus and John here. So look back in your Bibles. Look at chapter 1. Verses 31 and 32. It says, Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. So Jesus is going to be called the Son of the Most High, but John is the prophet of the Most High. So John comes to prophesy and call the people to repentance and forgiveness and the forgiveness of their sins. But Jesus comes to bring about that promised salvation. This is like at the beginning of a wedding. You have the family who enter, the wedding party enters, the ring bearer comes in, and just before the grand entrance of the bride, you have the cute little flower girl in a beautiful dress come waltzing in, throwing down petals, and preparing the way for the bride. Now it almost feels wrong to compare the wilderness prophet of John to a pretty little flower girl, but you get the idea. John is the prophet um, who's going to lead the way for Christ. But Jesus is the primary person, the most significant child to be born, and who's going to single-handedly fulfill all of God's promises and commands and accomplish the great eternal redemption of God's people. Luke picks up the Old Testament language of Isaiah. Isaiah 40 verse 3 says, A voice cries in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. John has come to prepare the way of the Lord as a sign of the Messiah's coming and as a prophet calling the people to repentance. Luke verse 30, or 77 tells us that he, he prepares Jesus' way by giving knowledge of salvation and the forgiveness of sins. What secures this forgiveness is seen in verse 78. It's the tender mercy of God. The second half of verse 78 and 79 give us a picture of what this mercy is accomplishing. It brings light to the darkness in order to bring us to peace. Let's read it again. It says, Because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the, way, <clears throat> into the way of peace. The tender mercy of God leads his people through the forgiveness of sins to the place of peace. You can imagine, you know, you're out camping and you're sitting in the darkness in the early morning watching the sunrise. Everything around you becomes visible. It's beautiful. It lights your way and it shows you where you plan to go or where you are going. You can stand up, you can walk, you can follow the path and get to your destination because the light has come, the sun has risen. This is the role of John and the work that God is doing now. He opens our eyes and tells us the truth so we can follow the path of peace to our eternal home. 
This song reminds us of the great promises that God is fulfilling and yet strikes a chord with our present situation as we try and follow Jesus and yet struggle to know the way. We need the knowledge of salvation and the forgiveness of sins that John has been raised up to spread. We haven't arrived at the place of perfect peace yet, but we are on the way. We are in process. We're on the way to God's peace. So as we see the way for the light to shine in darkness is through that knowledge, the knowledge of salvation and the forgiveness of sins, and we ought to keep our hope oriented there. It's through the knowledge of the gospel that John is supposed to prepare the way of Jesus, and it's our call to fulfill Jesus' mission by spreading that knowledge to the world. God's mercy expressed in the forgiveness of sin is the only hope of joy for our lives and for those around us. We don't simply need a change of circumstances. We need a Savior who is able to deal with our sins in a real and final way. And to bring us to a kingdom free from sin, where suffering will be no more and we will know true peace. Friends, the way to have joy this Christmas is to take our eyes off of our present circumstances and fix them on the eternal, personal, and promised mercy of God, mercy tenderly expressed to each of us in unique and personal ways, mercy faithfully promised and planned from eternity past to eternity future, and mercy that is most clearly displayed in the forgiveness of sins brought about through the birth of God's Son, the most important child that this story anticipates, the foundation of our hope and confidence, and the clearest demonstration of God's tender mercy towards sinners. Oh, that God's mercy would grip our hearts and fill our minds so that we could have joy in Christ this Christmas season. But even as we face difficult circumstances and struggles, we know that God is faithful to his promises and we are almost home. That promised land is calling. We're almost home. Not a tear shall fall then. We're almost home. Make ready now your souls for that kingdom come. No turning back. We're almost home. As I close, let's let's fix our eyes on that home that we await. I'm just going to read from Revelation 21. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. What a hope we have to look forward to in God's promised mercy, and what a comfort we have in God's personal mercy. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have given us so much, so many ways to know you in your word, to see how faithful you are in dealing with your people, how kind and merciful you are. We thank you for all the great promises that we can believe and hope in. And we ask that as we go from here and as we go through our life this week, that you would fix our eyes on the eternal work of redemption that you are doing and you would give us joy in Christ. Joy that is greater and stronger than the temporary sufferings or difficulties that we are facing. Would you give us hope amidst amidst our day-to-day trials? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Would you stand with us? And as we respond, let's together sing joy to the world. joy to the world through our Savior who came and is coming. Let's close with these words. He who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen.